Good morning. morning. Welcome to everybody here gathered today and watching at home on our live stream. I'm glad you're here with us this morning to celebrate together a service I first experienced now 11 years ago, back when I was a seminary field worker at Zion. I remember that day in November 2009 as I watched as we all worshiped together by highlighting every season of the church year in just a single hour, rehearsing themes that have only grown to mean more to me as I go throughout my life. What I've come to realize is the rhythms of the church seasons, they call us out of our ordinary patterns, and they invite us as the church to take part in something extraordinary. Year after year, we recall the mystery and the wonder of the events and the teachings in the life of our Lord. We celebrate seasons of Christmas and Easter, and we prepare for those times through Advent and Lent. Then, of course, there's Pentecost, where it all began. I suppose it's right then that we begin here with red on the altar, recalling those first flaming tongues of fire that came to rest on the disciples' head and marked them as ones now filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who that day gave birth to the church. The same Holy Spirit has continued to dwell in the hearts of God's faithful people for now 2,000 years, poured out in the waters of holy baptism, fed to us in the Lord's Supper, and preached into the depths of our souls through the hearing of God's word and the proclamation of his forgiveness. It is the power of the Holy Spirit who makes faith possible, gathers us here together as a church this day, and animates our lives of love and service for God and neighbor. The truth is, Jesus never left his church alone apart from his presence. No, he gave us a helper, one he would call the comforter to guide and direct our ways to direct our days in truth and life until he comes again. God's presence didn't leave us at Jesus' ascension. No, it was transformed. No longer dwelling in a human body in the form of Jesus on earth, God now dwells by the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Now, now we have the power to walk not as children of darkness, but as children of the light. We walk in the light of the one in whom there is no darkness at all. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
be seated. The king shall come when morning dawns and light triumphant breaks. We'll sing those words in a moment. I've always found it special that while the light of our days continually recedes as winter draws near, as a church, we're celebrating the season of Advent. And we're looking forward to the coming of the light of the world and a new day that will soon dawn. As the rest of the world sees only increasing darkness, we who trust in Jesus focus our hearts and minds on light. Now, it's not that there's no light right now. Far from it. Jesus has already shown his light into our dark world by revealing himself to men. Those who trust in Jesus are called children of the light for a reason. For we live as in the daytime, not in the deeds of darkness. We shine, Scripture says, like very stars in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. But nevertheless, darkness remains in our world and admittedly even in our hearts. So we must continue to encourage one another with hope. And that's what Advent's all about. It's a season of hope. We anticipate when Christ will make good on promises to return. We remember how he came once before as a babe in a manger in Bethlehem. Even as we confess, he'll come again. This time not humbled and helpless, but in glory and splendor, in honor and in praise. No, we don't know the day or the hour, but we do remain watchful. We bring our oil, we trim our wicks, and we light our lamps. We resolve to stay awake for the call that the bridegroom is near. And to stay ready for this day, we do some things that might seem silly to the world, but to us, they are deeply meaningful. Every year, we listen again to John the Baptist's ancient call to repentance, to make straight the way of the Lord. We put ourselves in the shoes of God's people of old, and we listen again to the prophets as they anticipate and foretell Jesus' birth. As we count the days to Christmas... We're also counting the days until our Lord returns again, knowing that each waking hour is nearer to our salvation than when we first believed. So we wait for this patiently. We wait for it in hope and in joy and in love and in peace, those time-honored themes of our Advent celebration. Our prayer throughout this season is, Come, Lord, come quickly. For when he comes, a new day will dawn, a glorious day, when light triumphant breaks. Well, good morning, boys and girls. Uh, Every year on this Sunday, we take the opportunity in the children's message to introduce all of you as families to devotional materials that our devotional life team has carefully uh, selected and prepared for you out in the narthex. Uh, We have a great devotional life team. And as you see, not only were these devotions set out, but there were placards hanging from our ceiling directing you to the right one for your family. Unfortunately, this year they were so popular that they're just about gone. So we will uh, get with our devotional life team, see if there's any resources to supplement and backfill those. But uh, if that doesn't happen, you should have all received a mailing from the church and the devotional life team with a letter and a a devotional put out by Lutheran Hour Ministries this year. And at the very least, I would encourage you to let that guide your family this Advent season. 
Uh, one that there are still some left from, especially designed for children, is this one, Come Lord Jesus. And I've never seen one like this before, but it's actually a coloring book and a devotional book all in one. So I was pretty excited about this. I want to introduce to you the first days of devotion. And for each several days, there's a, a page that you can uh, color. It says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. The whole earth is a messenger sent to point me to you, Lord Jesus. For the earth is your creation, I know. Your Father sent you his beloved word out into deep darkness. Light, he shouted, and poof, light appeared. Wow, what power you have, what beauty you control. That's what the earth tells me about you, Lord Jesus. You had your hand in making this huge and lovely thing. The whole world proclaims you. Lord, even if the stars point to you, because you were there when they were created, they sing songs of praise to you. Do you remember those songs? Of course you do. Do you ever hum them as melodies that wind through your mind? Eventually, another star would point the way to you as well. It would lead wise men to worship you in Bethlehem. Next time I look at the stars, I'll try to remember your greatness, and I'll sing a song of praise. So there are some of these left out there if uh, one per family want to grab them and take turns coloring them throughout this Advent season. Now, kids, do you think I can use my magical powers to color this page up on the screen today? I think I can do that really fast? I want you all to close your eyes. At the count of three, you're going to open them. One, two, three. Look at that. Wow. So parents, if you want to get out your cell phone, and take, that's the best way to color that page. You can take a picture, bring it home to your children, and show them so that they can copy it. Please fold your hands, bow your heads, pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, Dear Father in heaven thank you for filling our world with light. Thank you for filling our hearts with love. Help us be like stars that point others to you. Amen. that trouble me along this weary road whispers of elation and unrest despite surrounding chaos this child within me grows he is my son but through him I myself am promised sons as a starry sky from David would come a redeemer to fulfill these father's blessings who am I how can I be sure I'm not a dreamer he's my baby he's little one all these trouble cannot touch you the road is long but safe you'll always be for I know God will be with me what if I do not understand just what this all means it really doesn't matter, you're beside me. The journey's long and the future yet unseen, but this I know, God will be with me. Peace, my baby, peace, little one. All these troubles cannot touch you. The road is long, but safe you'll always be, for I know God will be with me. The stars are singing out a promise of old, lullaby to this child with 
within me. No matter what comes along, my soul at rest can be, for I know God will be with me. Peace, my baby, peace, little one. All these troubles cannot touch you. The world had long waited in darkness for the coming of a Messiah. And in what an unexpected way he came, born of an unwed virgin, wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a dirty manger. He would go by the name Jesus because he would indeed save his people from their sins. Born in such ordinary and humble fashion, and yet what followed was nothing short of extraordinary. Angels burst forth on the seam and proclaimed to lowly shepherds the majestic birth. Glory to God in the highest was their joyful song, and they promised peace to all the earth and goodwill to every man. The Christmas gift was given for us all. Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, who was begotten of his Father before all worlds, he became flesh, became one of us, became a true man and dwelt among us. In Jesus, God united himself with his creation forever, bridging the gap between those who dwell in darkness and the one who dwells in inapproachable light. Christmas shows, above all, God's love for a broken world. The prophets had long waited for this day. At his conception, the light of the world burst forth into a world of darkness. And when that babe uttered his first cries, the hope of the world was realized. But the gift was given silently on a cold and still night in a stable. Upon the darkened streets of a small country town shone forth an everlasting light. The hopes, the fears of all the years, they met together there. At Christmas, the church begins its celebration of the life of Christ, a celebration that will continue throughout Epiphany and Lent and Easter. But it all began there, in the quiet streets of Bethlehem.
In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Epiphany. If you're like me, it was a long time before you even understood what that word meant, and perhaps you still don't. It simply means the appearing. It's a bit of an understatement, I think, but just how else do you describe divine footsteps treading on the very sod he himself spoke into existence? But for 30 years, a few knew it. Oh, Mary knew and Joseph, they'd been told in a dream before he was born. And there were moments along the way that reminded them. There was his naming day. When departing from the temple, Simeon had raised this child high in the air and sang about he who would be a light to the Gentiles and the very hope of Israel. There was that strange trip to Jerusalem when they'd left Jesus behind, only to return and discover their 12-year-old son debating with the scribes and the Pharisees. But the rest of the time, it seemed, he was like any other boy learning carpentry from his father and minding a bit better than most children around the house. But things began to change so quickly. He ran out into the wilderness to be baptized by his cousin John, and then, for only the second time in the history of the world, men heard God's voice speak from heaven, and it said this. It said, this is my son. I love him. Listen to him. Then Jesus disappeared into the desert for 40 days with no food or water and survived Satan's darkest temptations. And then his true work began. 
Upon those dwelling in a land of darkness and in a region in shadow of death, a light was dawning. Those in Galilee were the first to witness this appearing. He taught in their synagogues. He proclaimed good news from his Father in heaven. Oh, the miracles and the healings and the casting out of demons. Once he appeared, it seemed the whole world had changed. Great crowds began to follow him. Disciples started to learn from him. And then one day on a mountain, a few chosen disciples were privileged to see Jesus transfigured in all his glory, his garments shining brighter than the midday sun. He was indeed one who was breaking darkness with a liberating light. Here indeed was a life that would give light to every man. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. They brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. 
And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Apostle John writes that though the true light which enlightens everyone had come into the world, and though the world was made through him, people did not receive him because they loved darkness more than light. After celebrating our Savior's life in the Epiphany season in Lent, we prepare our hearts to meditate on his death. Royal purple on the altar calls to mind that in spite of his passion, crucifixion, and death at the hands of mere earthly authorities, He is the only true and rightful king. His crown is not made of gold, however. Rather, twisted thorns pierce his brow. The point of his life, you see, was not to reveal his glory, but to bleed and to die for sinners. The way he shines forth his love for us is by hanging on a cross and dying a death we all deserved. It is during this time of Lent when we reflect deeply on the reality of sin that is ever-present in all our lives. We recall it was not just the darkened lives of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, or even Pontius Pilate who killed the Son of God. It was truly also our sin that nailed him to the tree. It was as if we pounded the nails into his hands and feet and thrust the spear into his side. And when we continue to live in darkness, we turn again away from the one true light who gave himself for us all. Every one of us is guilty. The only way out of the darkness is through repentance. And so we do just that. We come before him and we confess our sins. We acknowledge our guilt and we lay it at the foot of the cross. Or better yet, perhaps, we lay it upon Jesus. And what we then come to recognize is this wonderful reality that the drops of blood dripping down from that cross, they free us from our sin and our shame. Because of this, when we confess... We get to experience God's blessing and Christ's forgiveness. We get to hear his word of absolution spoken over us. Our Savior speaks to us not only a word of condemnation, but certainly one also of pardon and of peace. Please rise. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, 
They were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. While it was still dark, they arrived and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Isn't that kind of a description of the world in which we live? We who still live in the darkness of the world, in the midst of that darkness, we know that light has ultimately conquered. But how do we know this? Because through the dusky shadows, we peer into the mist and we see that the stone is rolled away. The grave is empty. Jesus is not there. He is risen. The sadness of Good Friday is dispelled by the joys of Easter morning. Now each day our hearts can awake in gladness, knowing the dark of night shall soon be ending. After gloom and sadness at last, the glorious sun has shone forth. 
Paul once wrote that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, that we're still in our sins, our faith is futile, and actually we're to be pitied more than all men. But indeed, Christ has been raised from the dead, and he is only the mere first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Because Christ is arisen, we too shall be raised. And we relish in this Easter celebration for eight glorious weeks every church year. The color of the season is white. I like to think of it as representing the robes of righteousness we will wear in eternity, spotless robes washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And thinking of that day of our own resurrection, it's worth noting that some feel it is more appropriate to refer to this Sunday as Resurrection Sunday. But I'm here today to say the term Easter has its merit. It comes from a Middle, Eastern, or Middle English word, ostern, and it denotes the direction from which the sun greets each new day. You can hear that it's not too far removed from our own word, eastern. Easter, then, is a fitting name for the day which celebrates the rising of the sun, Jesus Christ, just as that celestial sun itself broke on the horizon. On that morning... At the light of day, light conquered darkness. Jesus' death broke death-strung bands, and now he stands at God's right hand, the resurrected one. And we, gathered here below with glad hearts, we now praise him evermore with loud songs of alleluia. Please stand for prayer. Let us now pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Lord, we come before you today praying on behalf of all those who suffer. We pray, Lord, that as they struggle, that they would be reminded of your presence. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. We also come before you today, Lord, praying for all those who celebrate, that you would give them hearts of thanksgiving oriented toward you for the tremendous blessings you have lavished upon us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today, Lord, we pray for all as we enter this Advent season. We pray, Lord, that you would give us patient anticipation, that you would give us joy to celebrate, and that you would give us strength to serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and grant you his everlasting peace. Amen. Please be seated. It began by saying these words, in Jesus Christ there is no darkness at all. We do look forward to that day when we see the new Jerusalem coming down from the heavens, when God forever establishes his presence with us on an earth made new. We look forward to the day when no sun or moon or star ever need give light, for Jesus himself will shine forth as the light of the world. Nations will walk by this light and people will live in his light forever. Today's service has been a journey through the church year once again. Perhaps a tedious journey, but almost certainly a faith-filled journey. We've anticipated his birth and then celebrated it. We've beheld his life, despaired of his death, and even rejoiced at his resurrection. And now, at the end, we consider beholding his eternal glory. For Jesus, even now, is seated at God's right hand, watching over all things and steering the course of the history of the entire world towards one glorious end, your eternity with him. That's right. What I'm saying is that every single thing that happens every single day is being molded and orchestrated for the sake of the church on earth. Our physical eyes will no doubt find this difficult to perceive, but our eyes of faith will confess that what is unseen is what is true reality. You see, that's part of what it means to acknowledge that Jesus is our king, to determine that his purposes are at work in all things, by acknowledging that nothing happens apart from his will. And make no mistake about it, the king is coming again at the sound of the trumpet, at the cry of an archangel, and all will see. He will judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will never end. The king will separate the sheep from the goats. The goats will be cast into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But we who trust and believe, the sheep, we will be placed at God's right hand and we will receive on that day our crowns of eternal life. But our focus on that day will not be on our crowns, but rather upon the Lamb who is seated on his throne, the one who forever bears in his body the marks of the crucifixion. Those are the marks of our salvation. So, summon the sacred throng to sing. Let angels fall prostrate before this king. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him the Lord of all. We rise. Mm -hmm. 